basically sort of hanging out in between the mountains, eating nuts off trees, and using the latest technology, like stones and bowls. Ding dong, it's the outside world, and they have technology from the future, like really good metal and crazy rice farms. Now you can make a lot of rice really, really quickly. That means if you own the farm, you own a lot of food, which is something everybody needs to survive. So that makes you king. Rice farming and rice kingdoms spread across the land, all the way to here. The most important kingdoms were here, 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 and here. But this one was the most, most important. Ruled by a heavenly super person, or emperor for short. Knock, knock, get the door. It's religion. The new prince wants everyone to try this hot new religion from Biekt. Please try this religion, he said. No, said everybody. Try it, he said. No, said everybody again, quieter this time. And so the religion was put into place, and all the rules that came with it. Then the government was taken over by another clique, and they made some reforms, like making the government govern more, and making the government more like China's government, which is a government that governs more. Hi, China, they said. Hi, dipshit, said China. Can you call us something else other than dipshit, said Japan. Like what, said China. How about something said Japan. And they stole China's alphabet and wrote a book about themselves. And then they made lots of poetry and art and another book about themselves. Then they stopped moving the capital every time the emperor died and kept it in one place for a while, right here. And they conquered the north, finally. Get that square away. A rich hipster named Kukai is bored with modern Buddhism, visits China, and learns a better version, which is more. Spiritual. Comes back, reinvents the alphabet, and causes art and literature to be great for a long time. And the royal palace turned into such a dream world of art that they really didn't give a shit about running the country. So if you live outside the palace, how are you supposed to protect your shit from criminals? Hire a samurai. Everyone started hiring samurai. Rich and poor people hired samurai. Poor people who could not afford to hire samurai did not hire samurai. The samurai became organized and powerful, more powerful than the government, so they made their own military government. Here, they let the emperor still be emperor, but the shogun is actually in control. Breaking news, the Mongols have invaded China. We've invaded China, said the Mongols. Please respect us, or else we might invade you as well. Okay, said Japan. So the Mongols came over, ready for war, and died in a tornado. But they tried again, and had a nice time fighting with the Japanese, but then died in a tornado. Then the emperor overthrows the shogun, and the shogun overthrows him back, and moves to Kyoto, and makes a new shogun. And the emperor can still dress like an emperor if he wants, that's fine. There's more art. Like painting with less colors, collaborative poetry, plays, monkey fun, tea parties, gardening, architecture, flowers. It's time for who's going to be the next shogun. Usually it's the shogun's kid, but the shogun doesn't have a kid. So he tries to get his brother to quit being a monk and be the next shogun. He says okay, but then the shogun has a kid. So now who's it going to be? Vote now on your phones. And everyone voted so hard that the palace caught on fire and burned down. The shogun actually didn't care who saw some new poetry. And the whole country broke into pieces. Everyone is fighting with each other for local power, and it's anybody's game. Knock knock, it's Europe. No, they're not here to take over. They just want to sell some shit, like clocks, and guns, and cheese. So that's cool, but everyone's still fighting each other for control, now with guns. And wouldn't it be nice to control capital, which right now is puppets, with no one controlling them? This clan is ready to make a run for it, but first they have to trample this smaller clan, which is in the way. Surprise, the smaller clan wins, and the leader of that clan steals the idea of invading the capital and invades the capital. And it goes very well. He's about halfway through conquering Japan when someone who works for him kills him, and then someone else who works for him kills them. And that guy finishes conquering Japan. And then he confiscated everybody's swords and made some rules. And now I'm going to invade Korea, and then hopefully China, he said, and failed, and also died. But before he died, he told these five guys to take care of his five year old son until he's old enough to be the next ruler of Japan. And the five guys said, yeah, right, it's not going to be this kid, it's going to be one of us, because we're grown-ups. And it's probably going to be this guy, who happens to be way more rich and powerful than the others. <laughs> they have a fight, and he wins, and starts a new government right here. And he still lets the emperor dress like an emperor, and have very nice things. But don't get confused, this is the new government, and they are very strict. So strict, they close the country. No one can leave, and no one can come in. Except for the Dutch, if they want to buy but they have to do it right here. Now that the entire country was not at war with itself, the population increased a lot. Business increased, schools were built, roads were built, everyone learned to read, books were published, there was poetry, plays, sexy times, puppet shows, and Dutch studies. People started to study European science from books they bought from the Dutch. We're talking geography, skeletons, physics, chemistry, astronomy, and maybe even electricity. Over time, the economic and cultural prosperity began to gradually slow down. Knock knock. It's the United States. With huge boats, with guns, gun boats. Open the country. Stop having it be closed, said the United States. There was really nothing they could do, so they signed a contract that lets the United States, Britain, and Russia visit Japan anytime they want. Choshu and Satsuma hated this. That sucks, they said. This sucks. And with almost very little outside help, they overthrew the shogun and somehow made the emperor the emperor again and moved him to Edo, which they renamed Eastern Capital. They made a new government, which was a lot more Western. 
They made a new constitution that was pretty Western, and a military that was pretty Western. And do you know what else is Western? That's right, it's conquering stuff. So what can we conquer? Korea. They conquer Korea, taking it from its previous owner, China, and then go a little bit further. And Russia rushes in out of nowhere and says, Stop, no, you can't take out, we're going to build a railroad through here to try and get some more water. And Russia fills their railroad, supervised by a shit ton of soldiers. And then when the railroad was done, they downgraded to a fuck ton. Did I say downgraded? I meant upgrade. And Japan says, Can you maybe chill? And Russia says, How about maybe you chill? Japan is kind of scared of Russia. You'll never guess who's also kind of scared of Russia. Great Britain. So Japan and Great Britain make an alliance together so they can be a little less scared of Russia. Feeling confident, Japan goes to war against Russia. Just for a moment. And then they both get tired and stop. It's time for a The world is about to have a war. Because it's the 1900s and the weapons are getting crazy. And all these empires are excited to try them out on each other. Meanwhile, Japan has been enjoying conquering stuff and wants war. And the next thing on our list is this part of China and lots of tiny islands. All that stuff belongs to Germany, which just had war declared on by Britain because Britain was friends with Belgium, which was being trespassed by Germany in order to get to France to kick France's ass because France is friends with Russia, who was getting ready to kick Austria's ass because Austria was getting ready to kick Serbia's ass because someone from Serbia shot the leader of Austria's ass, or actually shot him in the head. And Britain is currently friends with Japan, so you know what that means. Duh, Japan should take the islands, which they wanted to do anyway. So they called Britain on the telly to sort of let them know. And then they did it. And they also helped Britain a little here and there with some parents and stuff. Now the war is over, and congratulations, Japan. You technically fought in the war, which means you get to sit at the negotiating table with the big dudes, where they decided who owns what. And yes, Japan gets to keep all that shit they stole from Germany. You also get to join the post-war mega alliance of the big nations, whose mission statement is to try not to take over the world. The Great Depression is bad. Japan's economy is now crappy, but the military is doing just fine, and it invades Manchuria, and the League of Nations is like, No, don't do that, the League of Nations is supposed to take over the world. And Japan says, How about I do anyway? And Japan invaded more and more and more and more of China, and was planning to invade the entire East. You've got mail. It's from Germany. <laughs> the new hero, Germany. He has a cool mustache, and he's trying to take over the world and needs friends. This also got forwarded to Italy. They all decided to be friends because they had so much in common. It's stuff for World War II. Then they invade the neighbors' neighbors. Then the neighbors' neighbors' neighbors, who happened to be Britain, said, Holy oh, shit. And the United States started helping Britain because they are good friends. And started not helping Japan because they're friends and our friends are not friends. Plus, they're planning on invading the entire ocean. The United States is also working on a large, very huge bomb, bigger than any other bomb ever, just in case. But they still haven't joined the war. War looks bad on TV, and the United States is really starting to care about their image. But then Japan spits on them in Hawaii and challenges them to war. And they say yes. And then Germany, as a symbol of friendship, declares war on the United States also. So the United States goes to war in Europe, and they help Japan chase Germany back into Germany. And they also start chasing Japan back into Japan. And they haven't used the bomb yet, and are curious to see if it works, so they drop it on Japan. Mason. Um, I did a double major in international development and international conflict. 
Um, I then did my master's in human rights at the London School of Economics. Then I did my undergrad at George Mason, uh, focusing on history, and my master's in education. Um, so we're going to be talking about the remilitarization of Japan. And the reason that video was so important is that it talks a lot about the historical context leading into this issue. So the video kind of touched on the idea of Imperial Japan. And imperialism is basically when a country either directly or indirectly takes over another country or territory. And the reason they can do this is for growth or expansion, um, or resources. It could also be just because, a justification for gaining more extra land or for the sake of uh, getting settling or economic colonialism, such as the Western expansion. What if it's to remove dictators? Again, usually it's like either for growing their country, so just to get bigger for the heck of it, or to steal someone's resources. So you can argue good reasons for the base. Yeah. So nationalism ends up becoming this idea or justification that a nation, nation has the right to go and colonize other nations. So just because they're so much better than another country, they think it's okay to go ahead and do that. Such as the Manifest Destiny. So this kind of ties into the idea of the Japanese spirit, and they preferred that their cultural values were so much better than other nations, um, such as China. They really saw them as inferior. Um, this kind of became affiliated with Japan, and it kind of started with this self-imposed um, peaceful isolation that Japan put itself in. And this ended um, when the uh, Beijing Emperor came into power. So we saw that when the Meiji Emperor came into power through the video, he kind of started focusing on taking over other lands. One of the reasons was he forced the constant army, so everyone was forced to serve three years. And because of this, it kind of instilled the patriotic spirit into everyone and focused the loyalty on the emperor. So because of that, they also, of course, started being very aggressive in this territorial expansion. So at the end of, um, before even World War I started, Japan had taken over several countries. Um, Hokkaido, Okinawa, they tried Taiwan. They had um, parts of Korea, North, um, East Asia, Northeast China. French Indonesia, just a bunch of different places. Korea in particular is noteworthy because they had been living under Japanese rule for over 30 years. Um, South Korea kind of saw this time as forced occupation by Japanese, and the Japanese kind of saw it as Japanese rule, which just kind of pushed that a lot of historians view that Japan's transgressions even helped World War II, just because the, like they invaded Manchuria, which put into more fire in this constant. So we talked about the content, um, context of pre-war Japan, how it looked like. We're going to go ahead and start viewing um, how Japanese con consciousness changed in World War II. So um, Japan kind of saw themselves as victims, and this mindset of victimization started um, primarily right after the war. So when the Allies, big news, Japan lost, when the Allies took over, the Supreme Command for the Allied Powers, uh, which was established, they believed that Japanese people were mainly followers and that this blind trust in their leaders kind of had a huge player into the cause of the war. So even in the Potsdam Declaration, which they were forced to sign, kind of their surrender, it said that for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan into embarking on the world conquest. So again, they saw that the Japanese people had kind of been duped into participating into this war. Um, this even fell into the emperor himself who they saw was being manipulated by radicals and militaristic nationalists. So even the state symbol um, had the idea that personal guilt could be eradicated, and even the emperor was never fully punished. Um, so even the general's population kind of bought into this idea. So one of the reasons why the SCAP did this was because they wanted to push forward with the times. By rejecting ownership of these militaristic ideas, they hoped that they would reject the government's past ideas of nationalism and moved Japan into a more democratic functioning government. So when we talk about Japan seeing themselves as victims, a lot of people view this stemming primarily from the atomic bombs. So the idea of victimization of Japan is usually globally accepted when we're talking about nuclear weapons because they're the only country that have ever suffered from the atomic bombs. Um, now it's no interesting to note that this identification did not start directly after the two bombs hit. Um, it kind of became into play in Japan after um, another bomb happened. So the U.S. was testing hydrogen bombs near Japan, and a small Japanese tuna boat was actually affected by the bomb. They were told that they were outside of the danger radius zone, but they weren't. The crew got um, radiation poisoning, and even the captain died within the year. 
So the tuna catch was completely contaminated. It caused temporary closure of the fish markets. Widespread um, examination of foods happened. Hyper awareness and fears of death due to radiation sickness kind of bridged the idea of wartime past and post-war identities of victimization. So this is seen through lots of media, um, in the forms of films, uh, manga, different formats, including Godzilla. And I have to say, yeah. Um, we're actually doing a panel on Godzilla and the Atomic Bomb tomorrow. Um, so if you want to learn more about that topic, just stop on by. Um, but we're going to try and be as quick as possible. So the Japanese didn't only suffer from the destruction of the atomic bomb, they also had other damages, such as the firebombing. Um, a lot of people kind of go through this uh, kind of history. But the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey of January 19, from January 1944 to August 1945 said that the U.S. dropped about 157,000 tons of bombs on Japanese cities. So they even said that the atomic bombs were pretty devastating due to structural and human casualties, but the firebombing kind of no, no, had larger. That's the worst bomb. So the firebombing strategies were overlooked a lot of times during these calculations, but the death tolls for this period is estimated about 333,000 deaths. Um, this includes Hiroshima and the three days later the other atomic bomb in Nagasaki. Um, but the estimations can vary. Um, I've heard that they could be up to 190,000, um, so like almost 4 million. And this is because they kind of calculate the radiation sickness, the bodies that were never found, the missing people. So estimations vary in human loss. And of course, there's also the structural damage. About 15 million people were left homeless after it. Um, and if you haven't already seen it, uh, Grave of the Fireflies talks a lot about this, um, and that's pretty much the subject of the film. They're actually showing it here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Go see it, go cry, and then we are giving a panel on that as well. Um, so stop by and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and so we've talked about the uh, focus on Japanese victimization, um, but it's hard not to ignore or it's hard not to talk about what often gets ignored, which is the fact that the Japanese Imperial Army committed uh, wartime atrocities. Um, so one of them is the Rape of Nanking. It's a city near Shanghai in China that the Japanese um, had a long campaign against um, trying to capture the city. It was a very brutal campaign as well. Um, in December 1937, uh, Nanking finally fell to the Japanese soldiers. Um, and they began what's called an orgy of cruelty. Um, by the end of the massacre, between 260,000 to 350,000 Chinese civilians had been killed. Um, between 20 and 80,000 Chinese women were raped. More than a third of the city was burned to the ground. Um, and this toll exceeds the death toll of um, the atomic bombings and a lot of death tolls from European cities during the war. Um, but this often gets overlooked. Um, and Irish Chan, who's a historian, called it the, forgot, or the forgotten holocaust of World War II. Um, and the issue of comfortment is another issue that is uh, very contentious um, within uh, Asian politics, um, especially between Japan, Korea, and China. Um, the Japanese Imperial Army established what they called comfort stations um, and its military bases and along the front lines. Um, and these comfort stations were camps in which the Japanese Imperial Army um, imprisoned non-Japanese women and girls whom the soldiers uh, would then routinely, routinely rape often dozens of times per day. Um, and the stories of these comfort women are just horrific if you ever decide to go look into it. Um, it's estimated that 200,000 women were forcibly seized from the countries that Japan invaded, um, mainly from the Philippines and um, Korea. So we've talked about uh, the war crimes that Japan had committed, um, but let's move on to the Japanese surrender. So with the acceptance of Japanese surrender, um, it was six days after Hiroshima, the U.S. began focusing on reforming its old enemy. Um, and they appointed, President Harry Truman appointed Douglas MacArthur um, as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers to supervise, to supervise the occupation of Japan. So the Japanese territories are designated by the Allies shall be occupied. So in this idea, um, the U.S. had a lot of influence on Japan. And to make sure that the Potsdam was complied, all 13 points 
the Japanese government, one of the points was that the Japanese government shall remove all obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the people. So the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, US, kind of had direct control over the main island supported a little by the British um, Commonwealth. But. Um, and as part of the surrender of Potsdam, uh, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East was established. Um, it's also called the Tokyo Trials. Um, it can, was convened in 19, July 1946 46, to try the leaders of Japan. Um, and the war crimes were broken down into three categories. You had your Class A uh, uh, war crimes, which are crimes against peace. So that is, those are your top leaders who decided to start the war. Um, you have your Class B war crimes, which are just your conventional war crimes. So just, you know, just shooting helpless prisoners. Um, then you have your Class C war crimes, which are crimes against humanity. So that would be things like conversations and the Nanking Massacre. Um, but there were a lot of issues with the tribunal that had lasting repercussions on the Japanese historical memory. So the first issue was just the Western influence over the trial. It was dominated by the Western powers, um, and they focused overwhelmingly on Japanese crimes against Western people, um, rather than the crimes that Japan committed in Asia against Asian people. Um, and only three of the 11 judges were Asian, even though, again, most of the victims of Japan were um, Asian, and none of those three were Korean. Um, so here's a picture of the judges, all 11 of them. Um, and here are the three Asian judges. You had an Indian judge, a Chinese judge, and a Filipino judge. Um, and those same statistics were represented amongst the 11 <coughs> prosecutors as well. Um, so another issue was that Japan had never had to properly atone for their crimes. Um, and that was because uh, the US planned to occupy Japan for years and worried that if they were to abolish the Japanese government entirely, it would cause backlash, riots, revolts. Um, so they decided that instead of allowing a vacuum, a power vacuum to form in Japan and allow God forbid communists to come to power, they decided to keep the emperor and keep the government intact. Um, and then another issue that came up was that uh, a lot of war crime, a lot of the uh, war crimes were treated as international war crimes. They weren't seen as being committed. They weren't seen as war crimes under Japanese domestic law. So it provided a sort of it provided a sort of loophole for modern Japanese politicians to say that Japanese crimes were never committed. It was Western imperialists who came into Japan um, and let sent down these punishments. So in accepting surrender, one of the things they had to do was kind of remove the existing Meiji constitution. Again, this was to move the militaristic system that they had, the monarchy, to more liberal government. So during the proceedings, um, General MacArthur was unsatisfied with how it was happening. And so in, with the draft that was being pushed on by the constitutional scholars of Japan, the Japanese people. So instead, he had a new draft created by his own um, people. He didn't even let the Japanese officials know, and they weren't aware. They were given then uh, the draft, which was in English, and they were allowed to make a few revisions before it was passed. So the modern Japanese constitution is based on three uh, principles that General MacArthur wanted, and they were popular sovereignty, pacifism, and human rights. So many Japanese conservatives kind of urged revisions to Article 9 because it was kind of dependent on um, American influence, and they kind of viewed that the constitution was drafted by U.S. occupation officer, so it has legitimacy for them. Um, so as for the new constitution that was put in place, um, the biggest thing to know is that it's the oldest unamended constitution in the world. Um, and Article 96 of the Constitution requires that if there is going to be an amendment to the Constitution, it first needs to be passed by both houses of the Parliament by a two-thirds supermajority. Then, once it's met that threshold, it then needs to go to um, a national referendum, and it would need to be passed by a simple, uh, simple majority. Um, and so Article 9, the topic of this panel, um, it's considered the pacifist clause, um, and it pretty much, it's the renunciation of war. Um, the big things to know are that um, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. Um, but this is not exactly followed to a T. Um, Japan has really found a way around this, and that's through what they call the Japan Self-Defense Forces. Um, it's been around since uh, 1954, um, and today it's 
in all but name a modern, well-equipped military, but in order to comply with Article 9, it gets labeled as a police force. Um, and Japan actually has the, war, uh, the world's eighth largest defense budget, um, and it has over 20,000 more active duty troops than in France. Um, and the Economist had a really good uh, line about how Japan doesn't call the SDF a military. Um, it says, as legal camouflage goes, this is like trying to hide a tank by sticking a post-it note on it. Um, and so as for the new government that was put in place, uh, constitutional monarchy, parliamentary system, the legislature is called the Diet. Um, you may recognize it as Shido's palace from Persona 5. Um, but as for the diet, it's bicameral um, legislature. You have the upper house and a much uh, more powerful lower house called the House of Representatives. Um, and the House of Representatives can override a veto um, of the House of Counselors, the upper house, with just a two-thirds vote. Um, but now that we've talked about the structure, um, the post-war structure that was put in place politically and um, with the government structures, um, let's introduce you to the political parties. Before so, you do that, yeah. I just, uh, you said it's the world's eighth largest defense budget, and you said something about mm -hmm. France? So they have 20,000 more active duty troops in Japan than France's military does, which is wild. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we're going to be talking about the LDP a lot. Um, it's the right-wing party in Japan, and it's pretty much the only party in Japan, um, because other than that, it's just a divided left-wing opposition. So the only other real major party um, that's existed other than the LDP was the Democratic Party of Japan, but they've had a lot of problems over the years, especially lately. Um, you have the D DPJ, um, and then they become the Democratic Party in 2016. And then they merge with the Party of Hope to become the Democratic Party for the People in 2018. So they can't really get their act together, so it just leaves a vacuum for the LDP to come to domination. Um, and you can see in this chart, green represents all of the LDP prime ministers. It's pretty much the only color up there. Um, and throughout their time in power, the LDP forged close ties with the US. Um, and they actually fought off public opposition to the U.S. maintaining military bases um, throughout Japan. <clears throat> and one of the big reasons for the LDP dom LDP's domination in Japan is uh, due to CIA intervention. So the CIA uh, financially supported the LDP through um, the 1950s and 1960s for a number of reasons. Um, they first wanted to gather intelligence on Japan, um, but what they really wanted to do was make it a um, bulwark against communism in Asia um, and undermine the Japanese left. So the U.S. was operating under the domino theory, which goes that if one country falls to communism, the rest are soon to follow. I have never heard a more slippery slope argument than that, um, but that's what they're operating under. Um, and there's a really good quote about this CIA intervention and how the focus moved from ferreting out nationalists in the Japanese party. Um, Washington was now fighting communists. Um, you would have the uh, Soviet Union explode their first nuclear bomb. China had gone communist. So the CIA finally decided um, they were going to support uh, the right-wing party in Japan um, out of fear of communism um, popping up in Japan. Um, but that support ended in the 70s. Um, so we talked about the LDP, but we want to go real quick into a timeline of the most prominent Japanese prime ministers when it's come to the issue of constitutional revisionism. So our first one, he's sort of like the first big bad of these prime ministers, um, Nobusuke Kishe. He is the grandfather of Shinzo Abe, um, and he had an affectionate title during the war, Showa Yonokai, the Showa era devil, um, for his rule in um, the state of Manchuria. Um, he signed a decree calling for forced slave labor of the Japanese people in Manchuria, um, and more than 10,000 Chinese, or sorry, 10 million Chinese citizens um, were, mo were mobilized to accommodate that. Um, he then spent three years in American detention as a suspected Class A war criminal, um, but he was never charged. Um, and he was eventually released um, as an anti a Cold War anti-communist, um, complete with American support and funding. Um, and during his time in power, he prevailed against the wishes of the Japanese people to um, 
forge closer ties with the U.S. in allowing the U.S. to maintain military bases on Japan. So our next one is going to be Asaku Sato. Um, he actually had a secret meeting in a hotel room with the CIA to seek funding for the LDP. Um, he announced the three non-nuclear uh, principles um, into the diet. Um, so that means the non-production, non-possession, and non-introduction of nuclear weapons into Japanese territory. Um, but while he's preaching these three non-nuclear principles, at the same time, um, he was aiding the US in Vietnam and um, allowing nuclear weapons into Japan aboard US warships. He's ironically the only Japanese um, laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize as well. Um, but to be fair, this is also the organization that gave uh, Kissinger a Nobel Prize. So uh, it's not the first time they've made a mistake. Uh, the LDP lost power in 1993 after a series of corruption cases, and it led to the election of Tomichi Moriyama, um, who was a member of the Japanese Socialist Party. Um, and during his leadership, he set up the Asian Women's Fund, um, which used private funds to provide compensation to former comfort women. Um, and after politics, he ended up becoming the president of that fund. Um, and he was the first prime minister to ever offer a full apology for Japanese um, war crimes. Um, but we'll talk more about that apology later. Um, our next one is going to be Junichiro Koizumi. Um, he is best remembered for the fact that he uh, would, yeah. <laughs> um, his hair and the fact that he would make um, visits to the Yasukuni Shrine, which is a very controversial um, shrine dedicated in Japan to uh, those who were killed during the war, um, but that includes a lot of class A war criminals. Um, so he really shattered relations between Japan and China because of these visits. Um, and he also laid the groundwork for more assertive nationalism. Um, and he endorsed both the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War. Um, and he didn't think that the Constitution prohibited um, the deployment of SDF forces abroad. Um, and then we have our current Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Um, but we're going to come back to him later. Uh, right now, we're just going to look really quickly up at that um, Moriyama statement, the apology he offered. It was given on the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, um, and it says that through Japan's colonial rule and aggression, they caused tremendous damage and suffering to the people of many countries, particularly to those of Asian nations, and that he expresses um, a feeling of deep remorse and states his heartfelt apology. Um, so it's the most clear-cut expression of remorse that any Japanese um, prime minister has ever given. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was undermined by the fact that um, his coalition uh, was very shaky and it included uh, the LDP, which meant that as soon as he gave this statement, you had minister after minister going to the Yasukuni shrine. <coughs> so we talked about like one shining beacon of acceptance of its past transgressions, um, but this wasn't the norm. So revisionist history is distorting or revising history to make events more or less favorable for an ideology or a group, for example, Holocaust denial. So because Japan kind of viewed itself as being a victim of its World War II, it led to it viewing the war in a rose-colored view. Um, it turned to revisionist history. The idea that the Japanese war and its victimhood kind of became a public acceptance by 1955 after the, for the first post-war generation. Um, this is seen in over three million um, payments made over to the Japanese overseas empire, and there are even some that try to claim um, war victim status to get more money out of it. Um, it kind of started during occupation when the Ministry of Education created new textbooks in social studies that condemned military and extreme nationalism. It also encouraged democracy. So these new textbooks assigned responsibility for the war on the militaristic groups, those few, and again, it led more leeway for the general public to get over it. Um, the laws after um, occupation contributed to the revision of the textbooks and the history that was taught to you know, students. So in the end, more power was given to administration. In the Ministry of Education, they changed in 1956, so the educational local school boards no longer um, were appointed, they were elected, and these were the ones that chose the textbooks. There was also a 1963 textbook law that changed so there were no longer smaller publications. Um, they were kind of pushed out of textbook businesses, so now it was only a couple major um, 
organizations that made all the textbooks for all the students. And because of the civil and administrative lawsuits that happened, um, the Ministry of Education kind of took on the textbook certifications. And this was a giant role of revisionism, um, which I kind of have personal qualms against, just because um, all the forms of censorship kind of really forced a different um, history that all the students were to come and learn. So you would think, though, that they kind of see themselves as a pacifist nation, that they wouldn't really commemorate their old militaristic values and natures, but you'd be wrong. Um, these are some monuments that I found um, in remembrance of the Kamikaze soldiers, which was a special attack force that committed suicide um, for their attacks. And annual memorial services are held during a lot of these monuments. That uh, wasn't all. I found several hundred um, all across Japan in all different forms and sizes. Um, the <coughs> memorable ones I wanted to mention was the, um, the shrine that some of our prime ministers have visited. And the reason it's such a controversial issue is because it's connection to militarism, emperor worship, and emperor-centric views. Um, so a lot of politicians kind of pay tribute to this. And the reason it's an insult to a lot of other countries that suffered under colonial rule is because it has um, some of the class A war criminals, 14 of them, so they're worshipped when this happens. And it also has a war museum that's found within it. Um, now, the war museum has a lot of interesting exhibits from um, kamikaze uh, bombing locations, artillery pieces, tanks, um, suicide attack submarines, um, videos praising Japan's military adventures. So when these prime ministers and other government officials come here, they really cause a faction near the other Asian countries who view that they're still keeping these ideas of militaristic values and nationalisms. And one example was uh, when Abe went, our current prime minister, he really angered China and South Korea. So a lot of these things that are seen in there um, kind of view this as a big issue. So I mentioned some of the textbook revisionists. Um, and the fact that top officials kind of choose to ignore the dirty past has a trickling effect. Since they kind of decide who's going to be picking the textbooks, it's seen in the textbooks, even to this day. Um, and we know that textbooks kind of model future citizens. So in this one textbook, you see that there's only a footnote on the rape of Nanking. And again, in the same footnote, there's only one mention of comfort women. So instead of history correcting itself, it's continuing during the 21st century. Um, the new history textbook completely dismissed the uh, rape of Nan King, only seeing it as a controversial incident, and it ignored comfort women altogether. Um, and there's a lot of debates going on about this. It's not totally unseen. There are historians and educators that want to put more truthful history and let it be presented, but because of all those laws, it makes it hard for them to let their voices be heard and make a difference. Um, I kind of see that history textbooks, that their content is being changed and modified as really like, it's a pee for me just as an educator because I know removing this topic from curriculum kind of really harms what the students are learning and it even makes it harder for a teacher to kind of enlighten and let their students expand their understanding of these important themes and topics. Um, so now back to Shinzo Abe, we learned about the revisionist history that's been going on um, in Japan. Um, but as for Abe himself, so he was originally prime minister for a year, but he had to step down due to a very scandal-related administration. Um, and he also suffered a humiliating election defeat in the upper house elections. But he was re-elected in 2012 as the prime minister. So what guides him? Um, so he is a member of an organization called Nippon Kagai Kaiki, um, and it's an organization that uh, sees its mission as promoting patriotic education, um, and a lot of the things we've been talking about. Um, doesn't see comfort women as an issue, um, supports official visits to the Yasukuni Shrine. Um, he wants to make Japan an Asian power with a voice that counts in world politics. Um, and he's unwilling to acknowledge these Japanese war crimes that we've been talking about. Um, and he's also rolled back restrictions on Japan's military um, that were imposed as part of the surrender. He is pretty much trying to make Japan into a regional power once more. Um, and he's been taking incremental steps to undermine Article 9. Um, no previous government has been as determined as his to pursue constitutional revisionism. 
Um, in a May 2017 speech, he promised to amend Article 9, um, but a 2012 draft amendment that was written by the LDP actually went further, um, proposing actively repealing it as opposed to just amending it. Um, and a lot of experts on Japanese politics believe that Abe's heart lies with that draft amendment rather than his discourse and speech. Um, in 2015, uh, legislation was passed that allowed Japanese troops to fight overseas for the first time since the end of the war, even if Japan wasn't attacked. Um, so the changes were highly controversial in Japan. This is not something that the Japanese people just didn't care about. Um, mass protests um, emerged on the streets of Japan, um, and you had protests of over 100,000 people spilling onto the streets and marching upon the diet. Um, the Japanese government actually even produced a manga and an anime to explain the bills to the public. Um, we tried our hardest, but we couldn't find those to show you. Um, but the protesters who were um, against these security bills, they were chanting slogans against what they were calling war bills. Um, and despite the protests, the passage of the legislation was never in serious doubt because the LTP coalition controlled super majorities in both houses. Um, but that didn't stop a brawl from breaking out on the floor of the parliament. Um, and there's actually video footage of it, and we're going to show it to you because it's absolutely wild. The actual sign I saw was Liberal Democrat Party's death, death day or day. So I've heard like multiple things. Um, so I'm willing to think that that's what it says as well, because I couldn't find a secondary source to check that the sign said no to obvious politics. So it either says no to obvious politics or it says something along the, line, along the lines of um, the day obvious party dies or something mm. like that. Um, again, I don't speak Japanese, unfortunately, and I could not find a good source. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing is that you would see you think that you would have people for these bills, but the thing that doesn't get talked about is how controversial this issue actually is in Japan. Um, so we want to talk about obvious justifications that, for revising the constitution. Um, the first of which is an increasingly aggressive and assertive China. Um, there is a belief that there is a need to boost deterrence against the, the growing Chinese military, um, and that was constantly in the background of the debate over these security bills that were passed. Um, and of course, there have been a number of confrontations in the South China Sea, uh, the Senkaku Islands, for example. Um, and the TPP was a way that Japan tried to curb Japan's growing, inf or sorry, Chinese growing influence in the region. Um, and Abe and Obama <coughs> both hoped to create a wall against China's strategic ambitions. Um, but unfortunately, these um, efforts were completely destroyed when Trump withdrew from TPP um, just three days into his presidency. Um, and so Japan no longer has the support in the US, of the U.S. along that issue. Um, so pretty much. China's rise is empowering the hawks in Japan, um, and the stronger China gets, the stronger Japanese hawks become politically. Um, the second reason is going to be uh, you have a belligerent North Korea. Um, North Korea has only grown more aggressive and assertive over the past couple years, um, and in August and September of 2017, North Korea actually launched two missiles over Hokkaido. 
Um, and you can see here exactly what the trajectory looked like. It caused um, sirens to go off, warning people to take shelter um, and take cover um, from the missile. I would have launched this back. <laughs> well, that's actually what the whole issue is, is should they militarize. But um, so uh, if tensions and another, so a thing is that the uh, if tensions between the North between North Korea and the U.S. were to ever escalate, Japan is a very easy target um, because they're so close by. Um, and along with South Korea's previous administration, Abe was able to uh, impose sanctions against North Korea, um, but now President Moon um, is seeking um, a diplomatic solution, um, making um, Abe even more isolated in the region. Um, and the more threatening that North Korea becomes, the more Abe's generally hawkish world um, makes sense to Japanese voters. Um, and as long as the issue dominates the headlines, um, Abe has an advantage. Um, and the final reason we're just going to glance over real quick is the fact that uh, there is an increasingly unreliable U.S. under Trump. Um, and this picture, I think, is like just the worst thing ever. Um, it's them with their stupid hats that Abe made that says, um, Donald and Shinzo make alliance even greater. Um, and of course, Trump signed them. Um, so Japan has been completely out of the loop on Trump's changing attitudes towards North Korea. Um, the government struggled to adjust to the fire and fury rhetoric, um, and then they were blindsided when Trump suddenly agreed to meet with Kim Jong-un. Um, and after North Korea launched missiles over Japan earlier uh, last year, um, Trump said that he could not understand why a country of samurai warriors did not shoot down the missiles. Um, so American presidents have long uh, treated Japan as their closest ally in Asia, um, but with Trump's preference for these authoritarian leaders, uh, Abe and Japan um, are understandably worried that he might pivot to China or North Korea. So last October, um, a snap election was held in which the LDP won a landslide, and you can see the election results here in this chart. Um, and Abe now has control with the coalition of two-thirds of the House, and he has the ability to make most legislation without approval from the upper chamber. Because again, you only need a two-thirds, uh, you need two-thirds supermajority in the lower house to override any vetoes from the upper house. So why did he win? Um, he actually has a really low approval rating in Japan. Only about a third of voters approve of him. Um, however, you can see in this graph, actually, um, how Abe's approval rating spikes um, following the North Korea missile being launched over Hokkaido. And many people who vote for the LDP, they only do so because they're worried about change and tensions on the, North, or on the Korean Peninsula. And voter, many voters decide that even if they don't like Abe, um, he's more likely than any of the alternatives to keep them safe. Um, but Abe's political woes have continued after uh, the election. Um, his popularity plummeted to below 30%. Um, and that has to do with what's called the more the more Itomo scandal, which involved allegations that a right-wing activist was given a really sweet deal on land um, because they had really close ties to Abe and his wife. Um, and reports actually came out that the Japanese finance ministry doctored documents related to the deal to remove any um, references to Abe or his wife. Um, and almost half of Japanese voters believe that Abe should resign over the scandal, um, and thousands took to the took to the streets to demand it. So he's not popular despite what we may think here. Um, but while parliamentary elections took place last year, LDP leadership elections took place this uh, last month um, in September. So he ended up winning a new three-year term despite the low approval ratings and scandals. Um, he won over one single challenger um, who failed to generate any enthusiasm. Um, and he is pretty much set up to become if he remains in power through November of next year, he will be the longest serving prime minister um, in Japan, Japanese history uh, since the war. Um, and Abe really just benefits from the idea that there is no viable alternative either within the LDP or amongst the opposition parties. So in short, the public at large believes that, the LDP, that um, Abe is the safest pair of hands despite many of his brushes with scandals. Um, and in his victory speech to the LDP last month, he of course said, I'd like to work on constitutional reform together with you. 
Um, and actually, Article 9 remains really popular with Jap the Japanese people, with only 18% of the public wanting it rewritten. Um, but we just want to leave you with two questions. First, has Japan ever really atoned for their war crimes? And was Japan ever really pacifist? Because these are the issues um, that have led to um, the contemporary problems. Um, and then, just two quick housekeeping. Here's just some recommended resources um, if you want to take a picture um, of great places to learn about contemporary Japanese politics as well as um, some of the history things we've talked about. And then, more importantly, we have other panels um, at the convention. We're talking about My Hero Academia later today. We're talking about uh, Godzilla and Grave of the Fireflies uh, t uh, tomorrow. And then on Sunday, we're wrapping up with the fun topic of the Yakuza. Um, so come see us. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> So you talked about Article 9 and about the Potsdam Declaration, and I'm just curious, when they agreed to do that, were there repercussions if they repealed that, and that's why they were on board with doing that? So are there consequences if they repeal that now in place, or they can just do whatever they want? And they can do whatever they want. Um, the issue is that if they were to repeal it, though, um, Abe risks humiliation because like we mentioned, um, the Article 9 is still really popular with the Japanese public, so even if he could force it through um, both chambers of uh, parliament, um, which he could, um, it would probably be, probably be defeated um, in a national referendum. And then who really knows like what that would do to the movement in the future? There's no punitive reason. Oh, no, no, no. There's no punitive reason. <laughs> If anyone else has questions, there's other panel starting, but like we are free. Thank you for the panel. Yeah. Very informative. Thanks. Willie, really, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ladies.